one thing we know about deer, the average deer, from a small fawn up to a large buck, if you average it all out, needs about six pounds of food a day. You know, some are gonna be less than that, some are gonna be more than that. Big bucks could be more, fawns gonna be less. The average is six pounds a day. Now, just do some math. That's over a ton of food throughout the year. So when they're going along here and nipping brows, you know, some aspen brows here, some dead oak leaves there, you know, they're getting nutrition, but it's all coming out of the soil. What's, what's coming out of that soil is how they're nourishing their bodies. It's no different than us. If I plant a tomato plant in sand, I'm gonna to get tomatoes, but is it gonna have the same amount of nutrition as if I planted it in some really just top-notch fertile soil? No, it's different. What that plant is, is a vector of what is in the soil. Same thing for whitetail. So what can we do as whitetail managers to help the whitetail? Many landowners head to their food plots armed with supplements to help with the deer nutrition. Those are great and wonderful resources to help, but they do not and cannot take the place of the proper nutrients a deer needs to survive and thrive. Well, we can plant food plots. We can plant food plot trees, apple trees, pears, plums, persimmons. We can augment what they get in their environment to help meet their daily nutritional and their yearly nutritional needs. Coming up later in the show, we're gonna hunt with Steve Bartilla in Illinois where he puts deer nutrition at the top of his list. But right now, Tim Newman from Analogix is gonna take us into a forest and show us how we can manage the understory for better deer and better deer hunting. All right, so we're checking out this property and the, the one thing I noticed right off the bat is in this area, we have a void of nutrition. And what that is caused by is a closed canopy and we don't have the amount of forbs or really a lot of growth like what we want. You can see out towards the edge of the property, uh, the amount of forbs that we've grown is much higher and that's because of the sunlight reaching the forest floor. So in this instance, I would recommend a thinning of these pines so that we can increase the amount of sunlight that is hitting the forest floor and that's gonna grow more forbs. Forbs is nutrition and there's a lot of uh, county and state foresters that are at your disposal. So if you have property that you want to increase the amount of nutrition by opening up the canopy, you can do things like timber stand improvement and you can do timber harvests to get more sunlight down to the level of the forest floor and that's gonna pop that forb growth. A lot of these forbs that these deer are eating are high in protein and it's, it's gonna be a cheaper way than planting food plots over the entirety of the property, but yet still keep the amount of forest that your deer are gonna feel comfortable. It's not like it's gonna be a clear cut across the entire property. All that's doing is creating more sunlight that is going to come down from the canopy that we're gonna open up and we're gonna create more green forbs on the forest floor. So forbs during the growing season are a great food source for the deer. Obviously in our food plots, we know that we're placing the forbs there, but you can't always plant 100% of your property. So that's where we let mother nature come in and we get these nice green forbs growing so that we can have the best nutrition possible for our deer herd. So get with the forester today, put a plan together and help reach your objectives. Deer and Deer Hunting Properties is brought to you by Analogix perfecting the science of deer feed. Ready to harvest a giant? Let Analogix help you attract, hold, pattern, and grow trophy bucks. Analogix, because there is no off season. Poor diet affects animals in much the same way it affects humans. You have to put the proper things in your body. Is there a difference between bucks and does? You bet there is. The nutritional levels for bucks and does their needs are going to be different in these ways. A doe basically needs just prime nutrition throughout the year. If she's gonna be bearing fawns the next spring, she has to have her skeletal size there. She's gotta have the proper body weight. You know, a doe fawn can breed. Normally when they get to 80 pounds or more in fall, a doe fawn will breed and conceive fawns that next year. 
A mature doe, she's gonna need optimal nutrition from lactation. She's gonna need it to get through winter. She's gonna need it in spring so she can carry that fawn to full term. So what we see is in areas that are lacking nutrition, does that come out of winter in poor shape, they're not gonna be successful mothers. So what are the physiological needs of bucks versus does? Well, they're the same and they're different. They're the same in the fact that if they get enough quality nutrition, they're gonna reach max potential and they're gonna be healthy. That's plain and simple. But for a buck, his needs are building that skeletal size and that body mass. And that's gonna come through age and it's gonna come through proper nutrition. So if he's getting proper nutrition, he's gonna reach you know, three, four, five years old. He's gonna peak out at three years old, he's gonna be a stud. At four years old, he's gonna be just be a brute and beyond that. And that body size is gonna be there. In most places, that buck's gonna be 200 pounds or way more than that. And it's, you know, it's muscle, it's body mass. Antler size is gonna be manifested through proper nutrition. Age and food, that's what they need, basically. We can talk about genetics all we want, but at the end of the day, a buck needs age and he needs a lot of good food to reach his max antler potential. Getting deer proper nutrition is not a one-time fix-all. As the seasons change, so does the requirements a deer needs to stay healthy. So when we're talking about nutrition, another thing to keep in mind is how bucks and does live differently on the landscape because they are two different creatures when it comes to that. Deer behavior is such in the fact that this is how it works for the most part. Does live in maternally linked groups. And what I mean by that is that you'll, if you look at a map, if you would just look a bird's eye view of a topo map where you hunt, and you just draw a bunch of circles that touch each other, and think of doe home ranges in that way. Doe home ranges is gonna be a mother and her daughters and her aunts and all these maternally linked females living on the landscape. That's why you see does in big groups sometimes when you see you know, 10 or 15 or even 20 does chances are extraordinarily high that they are all related. Those deer, like I said, they are sisters and mothers and grandmothers and they're living together. And how do they figure that out? No different than turkeys, it's pecking order. The older does, the more dominant does will establish their home range, their core range on the best habitat. And what is the best habitat? Not necessarily the habitat that has the best food the best fawning cover. Fawning cover is critical for does, and that's why we say those mature does are the best mothers, because through attrition, they've become the dominant females of the clan. They're gonna pick the best spot to live, and so on down the line. An easy way of thinking about this is how many times have you gone bow hunting in early season? If you might be on a little marginal property, I know a lot of them, a 10, a 15, a 20 acre property, and invariably that first doe that you kill is a yearling doe by herself. Those does, those younger does, they get pushed off to what I call the low rent areas. It's just like a city. You know, it, the, the best, the most dominant does get the high end apartments, the nice homes in the suburbs, so to speak, and those other does, they kind of get spread out through the community that way. That's kind of how it works. So if you think about it that way, that's how does live on the landscape. Okay, so now let's talk about how bucks live on the landscape. So when you put this all together, you can understand how the nutritional needs are met. But a buck, we always say for the most part, has a home range of about a square mile. So think about that as about 640 acres. But we as humans, we like to think in squares. We look at that map and we say, okay, here's 640 acres. That's gonna be the buck's home range. It doesn't work that way. Bucks live on the landscape in this way. Those mature bucks will occupy tight core ranges. And as we know, as a buck gets older, his core range shrinks because he knows that is his safe zone. That's where he's gonna live. It's got everything he needs. It's got food, water, and cover, and cover's usually pretty good. And he can evade predators, he can go there, and he knows he's not gonna get bothered. But a lot of times, if you look at a buck's home range, instead of that nice square 640 acres, that could be a long, skinny, you know, looks like links of a chain. It could be hopscotch. Basically, when you look at that topo map, look at the topography and the fact that where is the best cover on that? 
That's why you get trail camera photos of a mature buck here. Now, I'm not talking about the rut. The rut, you know, all bets are off. That buck could be going 5,000 acres. But throughout the year, his home range might be that long, skinny thing that just happens to have the best of all everything there, you know, food, water, cover, and it might be that way. It could be a square, it could be an oval, it could be an oblong. It doesn't really fit any specific format. What it does is, like I said, as that buck gets older, that's the habitat that he's going to prefer. Coming up next, the results of proper nutrition pays off in a big way. The topic today is nutrition. What whitetails need to thrive and survive, whether it's size or antler growth, nothing can affect deer like a lack of proper nutrition. Steve Bartilla knows how important the proper food is. Years of managing properties to their top potential has taught him a thing or two, and every once in a while, he gets to enjoy the results. Steve is in Illinois, the hotbed of big bucks, but they don't get that way by eating the wrong diet. Steve is set up on an open field and soon gets the chance at a beautiful, healthy buck that will make memories of a lifetime. Okay, so now here it is, opening day of Illinois' firearm season. <clears throat> I'm set up. I, I went ahead and game planned how I was going to go ahead and do this hunt. I, my one primary mission was to go ahead and shoot a management buck. I get up in the blind, I get everything settled, and <clears throat> looking forward to a glorious sit. And there he is. There he is in the corn, pops out. I could have shot him right then and there. It was right around 140 yards. But, but it's like, why, why push it? Why push it? And <clears throat> he's feeding. He may naturally come within range a little bit closer anyway, so let's, let's, let's just see how this plays out for a while. If you listen real carefully on camera, I think you can hear me say, dang it, <laughs> when he turns around and starts walking the other way. I go ahead and hit it a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit light the first time, doesn't hear it, hit it louder the second time, he hears it now. He's looking, he's looking, but he's not sure where these deer are. And the second he starts going like this, testing the air, bam, I'm hitting him a third time because now he's in the game and now I bet you he's gonna come. Sure enough, he does. He starts coming. He makes it about, but the problem is, is there's a bunch of deer off camera that you can't see on, on the shot. He ends up getting about, oh, maybe covers 10, 15 yards back towards me and he stops. And what he's really doing is checking out those other deer. Man, I do not want him to veer that way. Now's my time. I grab the, the 12 gauge, put her down. <laughs> Made the shot. He runs a little button hook out in the field and crumbles right in the middle. And just that quick, my Illinois season was wrapped up with one set. More than anything, I just want to say thanks. Honestly, I don't get to do this stuff without you guys. I know my footage isn't the greatest. I know that no one is watching me because I'm pretty or overly handsome. You're doing it because you trust me. And I take that incredibly serious and it means the world to me. Thank you. Hey, it's Jason Rickman with Deer and Deer Hunting Properties. Our next segment might not be as fun, but it's an important one and it's about financing your new property. You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting Properties. Deer and Deer Hunting Properties is brought to you by Orion Hunting Products. Engineered for stealth and safety, Orion's modular lightweight design allows you to set up camp anywhere you wanna hunt. No heavy equipment, no problem. Orion Hunting Products. Hey, it's Jason Rickman with DDH Properties. And now we're gonna talk about financing, right? The, the Probably the most important thing before we get started looking at our land is coming up with some financing options. So 
What I like to do uh, when I looked for my own personal property and I'm working with buyers looking for property, I wanna make sure that they've found a financial institution that knows hunting land or knows land, right? So that's always important because if there is sources of income from that land, that can be beneficial for that buyer, maybe in the form of what their lending power is. Maybe they can go a little higher that they weren't expecting. You know, maybe they can go from $200,000 property to $300,000 because there's income on that property. You know, the, the other aspect of it is, I'm looking for lenders that, hey, you know what, I don't have that 20% down or 30% down or 40% down. I wanna look at my options and see what lenders are out there that maybe give me some leverage as maybe 5% down or 10% down. So I encourage all my buyers to get out there, take a look at maybe two or three different institutions so you can get different perspectives and, and get to know who fits you. You know, a lot of times uh, the lenders I work with, they're hunters, they understand, you know, they'll, they'll go to bat for me on a property that, hey, they might need to get approval on because there's some, some weird things going on with it. And they'll be able to work that through with their lending institution to help me get my dream property. The other thing is, you know, when we're establishing our budget is to really take into account, is there, is there some financial gain on there when it comes to having a cattle rancher, CRP, uh, egg land that a farmer is going to use. You know, if you're if you're getting you know one percent return, a two percent return on that, that will allow your budget to go up versus staying at a certain dollar value. And let's say this. Let's say, hey, we can't get pre-approved right now. You know, that happens to some buyers, and a lot of times it'll happen as a first-time buyer. Maybe depending on where it is and who it is, sometimes sellers are open to seller financing. So basically what seller financing would be is there as a seller are gonna act as the bank for a year, two years, maybe even up to five years. They might require 5% down, 10% down, they might require 20% down, but it gives you a lot of flexibility as a buyer to maybe be able to get that first property. Typically on the, the easy to sell properties, we won't see seller financing as much, but a lot of times for a first time buyer, they're not looking for those really easy to sell properties because those are the ones that can get in those bidding wars. So a first time buyer is looking for something more, hey, I'm looking for that swampland, wetlands, where more established buyer that's maybe been through a di few different properties, they're not looking for that property. So that property can sit on the market and that sitting on the market costs the seller dollars a lot of times where they'll offer that seller financing for, for you as a buyer to be able to get your first property. And that's a really convenient and nice way to do it if we can find that seller willing to do it. But otherwise, if we're on to that second or third property or you're already financially established to be able to get that first property, shop around, get two or three options, you know, ask your deer and deer hunting property rep to see if they have any sources for you to go through that maybe they personally used or have had luck with other buyers, you know, through that financial institution.